standing for a prayer of illumination in the scripture reading. God, we pray that you would cause your word to be implanted deep into our hearts. And God, that we would live it by the power of the Spirit, knowing that in our flesh, in our humanness, God, it is hard. You are so good to give us a spirit. And God, I pray that you would help me. God, help me to speak your word. I pray this in the Son's name. Amen. You're reading Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, and then 46 through the end. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give praise and thanks. For you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. And now 46 through 49. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Behold, brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I want to invite you this morning to open up Holy Scripture to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And while you're doing this, I'm just going to read a few verses from Daniel chapter 7. Verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter in verse 15 of chapter 7. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions in my head alarmed me. Over the past few weeks, we've looked at that first episode of Daniel, all of chapter 1, episode 1. Today we look at episode 2, Daniel chapter 2. And you might remember me saying the past two weeks that there is a literary genius in the book of Daniel intentionally put together, and we're going to see that now. So if you do have your Bible, you're going to want to look at Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. These are both written in Aramaic, from 2 all the way to 7, and it functions together. Chapter 2 and chapter 7 parallel one another. Chapter 3 and chapter 6 parallel one another. And chapter 4 and chapter 5 parallel one another. So you begin to see the the beauty of the literary genius. And in chapter 2, we're going to see four kingdoms in the golden image. And in chapter 7, we see four kingdoms of beasts. In chapter 3, we see what? Bow before something. Give worship to someone other than Yahweh. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, absolutely not. And they're given a death sentence, ultimately being delivered. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel is told, for the next 30 days you cannot pray to anyone except the king. He rejects that. What does he receive? A death sentence. Lion's den. And he is ultimately delivered. And then smack dab in the middle, chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled. Arrogant king. Humbled. In chapter 5, King Belshazzar is humbled, although his humbling leads to his death. And so we see that this all goes together. It's telling a story from chapter 2 to chapter 7. And that story is simply this. Christ's kingdom is coming to shatter the kingdoms. The kingdom of Christ will shatter all of the kingdoms in the world, so do not lose hope while you are in exile. So we sit in between the time of the first advent and the second advent. 
Christ came, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for sin, buried, resurrected, ascended, rules and reign in session. We wait with hopeful expectation for the second coming. We wait for the second advent. And so just imagine a moment. Revelation 19, verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And so we're seeing in Revelation 19, Christ will come and he will strike down nations. It might be easy for us to look at nations in the past and think, well, of course, so you look at someone like Hitler in Germany, look at Mussolini in Italy. You can look at today of different rulers in the world who are brutalizing their people and think, of course Christ is going to come to strike down that nation. But it says he will come and strike down the nations. One day our own nation will be discarded and Christ sets up his kingdom. Corrupt rulers, corrupt leaders across the globe and their nations will be dealt with. In Daniel chapter 2, there's really kind of four episodes within an episode. And so we'll start with verses 1 through 16, where we see the wise men being summoned. They're summoned to Nebuchadnezzar. And so we learn that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that causes him great anxiety. I'm sure we can all relate to this, right? We get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning by what? A dream that is terrifying. And you know your night is shot. Turn on Netflix, you turn on Hulu, turn on whatever you can turn on to get the visions out of your head. And yet, maybe the racing heartbeat doesn't go away. It sticks. I'm sure we've all had the dreams of you're running late to something, and as hard as you can run, you cannot move out of the quicksand. Or one of my reoccurring dreams of being woken up in the middle of the night is there's a stoplight 100 yards away, and guess what goes? The brakes. The brakes go, and I can't do anything to stop. I know that there is going to be an accident coming up. And so Nebuchadnezzar's dream, this happens somewhere around 603 to 602 B.C., and he calls in all of the soothsayers, all of the mediums, all of those dabbling in the dark, demonic, occult rites, brings them in, and he lays out the stipulations. Tell me the dream, and tell me the interpretation. And if you don't, we'll kill you and destroy your homes. Nebuchadnezzar, it seems like rather irrational leader, maybe. But he realizes that these men have agreed to lie to him until the times change. And the wording for times here, it signifies a changing of the guard, changing of rulership. And so I have no doubt that Nebuchadnezzar knew in his heart this dream signifies something regarding the change of rulership in my kingdom. It's terrified. Fraught with anxiety. And he believes it's from the gods. Partly correct, except it's from God, not the gods. And so these men have agreed to lie to him. It would have been easy for Nebuchadnezzar to say, here's the dream, and then they talk with one another and they come up with an interpretation that is entirely false. But he says, no, no, no. You've lied to me. Tell me the dream and the interpretation. And their response to him, O oh, king, live forever. It's nice to butter up your boss before getting killed. O oh, king, live forever. One thing is certain that Nebuchadnezzar knew. Our time is limited. I will not live forever. 
earlier this week, the YouTube algorithm got me pretty good. It came up with a video on ranking presidents by a historian. I thought, ah, I'm not going to watch that. 30 minutes later, I was still watching it. Partly because my background in education is in history, so I love history. For me, I loved early world history. I loved everything up until really the Industrial Revolution, and then for me, I just wasn't passionate about it. So I love reading about Roman culture, Greek culture. I loved all of the early world stuff. And so as I watched this, this man just began listing out presidents in what he thought was the best order. Of course, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln go up top, on the very bottom, Woodrow Wilson, and then they kind of slotted from there. But you know what's interesting about the president and all of the leaders of the world? They don't rule forever. They don't. Rulers have always died, and kingdoms and nations have always fallen. No king and no kingdom last forever. And so you can feel the tension with Nebuchadnezzar. He believes that this is from the gods, and he's terrified. What will happen to my rule? What will happen? So the Chaldeans are put in a pretty rough position. They don't know the dream, and they sure don't know the interpretation. And so they say, this is too difficult, and no one has ever done this before. No king has ever said, tell me both. We've always received the dream and then given the interpretation. What you're asking for is unprecedented. And furthermore, no one can know this except the gods, and they do not dwell with much. You can just imagine for a moment, these great gods... Don't dwell with us to give answers? You have no answer from the gods because they don't dwell with us. And yet our God does. Our God dwells with us. We see this in Eden. God creates Adam and Eve, and he loves to dwell with them. He would walk with them in the cool of the day. He loves being with his people. And in grace, after they rebelled, he made a way for them to continually dwell with him, the promised Messiah. And then we see the book of Exodus. Or the pillar, fire at night, the cloud during the day, it dwells with the Israelites. Jude verse 5 says that is Jesus. Jesus led the Israelites out of Egypt. Jesus dwelled with the Israelites. And then God instructs Moses, here's how to build a tabernacle. Why? I want to dwell with you. And then the temple, God dwelling with them. And in Exodus 40 and 1 Kings 8, we see the glory of God flood into the tabernacle, flood into the temple. God's presence rests with his people. We see this in the incarnation. God himself, the virgin will bear a son, he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. God loves dwelling with his people. He loves it. He is not like these Babylonian gods who do not dwell with their people. God loves dwelling with us. And we see in the book of Revelation... The dwelling place of God is with who? It's people. You will dwell with God for eternity. Our God is not like the gods of the Babylonians. 
And the Spirit of God indwells us individually. And then when we come together corporately, localized, God's presence dwells with us. Why is Hebrews 10, 25, and 26? This mandates that believers gather together. And there is a reason why it's so important for believers to gather together instead of watching online. Unless, of course, there's medicinal problems or medical problems. But if there is not, it is mandated, dwell with one another. Do not forsake the gathering. Why? Because what we do here is a foretaste of eternity, forever. The presence of God rests with us as a local body now. It rests with Osborne. It rests with Trinity. It rests with all of these different churches that are gospel-believing, Bible-centered, resting with them now as he rests with us. It's why we're so grieved as session when people depart and don't gather anymore. Because they're not dwelling with God and with the local body. And so God gathers us every Sunday for his glory and for our good. The Almighty God dwells with us, unlike the gods of the Chaldeans. Our God is a good God. And so the scene ends towards verses 13 to 16 with Daniel coming on the scene. Nebuchadnezzar is furious and he makes a decree. Kill the wise men. He was hangry in that moment. And so we see a contrast between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar flies off the handle. What does Daniel do? He responds with prudence. And due to Daniel's wise response, he goes to the king and he gets the time of appointment to meet with him. Does Daniel know what the dream is or the interpretation? Not yet. Not yet. But we see that he will find it out in verses 17 through 30. And so in the midst of situations like this, where do you tend to turn? I tend, there's a handful of people that I tend to turn to moments of difficulty. I go to them, I text them, I call them, I give their ideas, then I bounce their ideas with one another to figure out what is the best potential answer. And then finally, when I come up with a really good solution, I then go to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a solution that I figured out. Is this good? Daniel and his three comrades, they go right to God. Write to God. And what do they seek? The Lord's mercy. Why? Without mercy, they're dead. They will be killed by Arioch. He will slaughter them. Their lives depend on the mercy of God revealing the dream and the interpretation. It revolves around a miracle. They need a miracle. And sure enough, the Lord extends mercy. He reveals the mystery in a vision to Daniel as he and his three friends sought the Lord. In verses 20 through 23, which I read earlier, we see a wonderful moment of worship. Daniel worships God for revealing the mystery to him. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, the great God of covenant, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we ask for. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Daniel's doxology reveals two categories. Who God is and what God does. God is eternal. 
He is wise. He is mighty. He is sovereign. And he is the one who reveals mysteries. He changes kings and kingdoms. He gives wisdom and knowledge and might. So once again, we learn the Lord is sovereign over the nations. This is a key theme for all of Daniel. And have you ever asked yourself, why is this a key theme? Why is the sovereignty of God over the nations such a key theme in Daniel? Because they would have been asking hard questions about God's sovereignty in exile. God, we're in Babylon. Where are you? God, you've taken our children off to Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Why does Daniel go? Are you in control, God? Are you sovereign? And the answer, of course, is a resounding yes. I'm in control. I'm the sovereign Lord over all the nations. This is the same key theme in the book of 1 Peter. We live as exiles. God is sovereign. And so we can look at the chaos in the world. We can look at rumors of wars and wars and not fret. God has it. And so like Daniel and his three comrades, we should seek the Lord in difficult times. And when he responds to answers and prayers, glorify him. Give him the glory. Daniel then comes to Arioch, and he tells them, I know the dream, and I know the interpretation. Hastily they are brought in, and Arioch takes credit. I have found an exile. And yet Daniel says, no one can reveal this except God. The contrast between the gods and the God is no more evident. These false gods could not give answers, but Yahweh can. As we move our way into verses 31 through 45, we come to the first ticking bomb of the book of Daniel. And so I'm going to outline a little bit, and then we'll work through the passage. There are many views on this passage, what the image is, what the kingdoms are, what the interpretation is. And I will let you know what mine is as we work through it. Um, but one of the things I wanted to say in the EPC, our vision, our, our hold for eschatology of last things is we believe that Jesus will return boldly and visibly. And so there's room, minor disagreements on our eschatology. And so the way that I interpret it will no doubt be different than some of yours in this room. And the way that you interpret that will no doubt be different than mine. And so I was actually listening to a sermon by R.C. Sproul on eschatology this week. He was just saying, for me, I don't become super dogmatic about these issues because I know I can be wrong. He said, my views on eschatology and the millennial kingdom specifically is I'm like a butterfly with sore feet. I land on something and I immediately have to get off. And so I pray that as we work through this, knowing that this is a time bomb, with different issues that people collide over, we would be gracious. So we come to the dream. And Daniel says that you dreamed a dream and it was frightening. This image before you was mighty, exceedingly bright, and it is frightening. So we get a little bit into why is Nebuchadnezzar so wrapped up with anxiety? What he sees is terrifying. The head of, was made of fine gold, chest and arms of silver, middle and thighs bronze, legs of iron, feet partly of iron and clay. And then stone. Stone not made with any human hand, it struck the image and broke it to pieces. And like the chaff of summer, it blew away. 
and the stone becomes a great mountain. Then we come to the interpretation. And this is where the time bombs begin to explode. The traditional view on this passage, we see it going back between year 100 to 200 by one of our church fathers named Irenaeus. He was discipled by Polycarp, who was discipled by the Apostle John. And so this view is the one that I hold. It's called the Roman view. It's been accepted for most of church history across the past 2,000 years. And the Roman view is this. The head is Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. The chest and arms of silver are the Medes and Persians. The legs, I'm sorry, the middle and the thighs of bronze are Greece. The legs of iron and the feet are the Roman Empire. That is the historical view on this passage. The other historical view on this passage is similar but slightly different. Babylon, the Medes, then the Persians, and then Greece. In the last 150 years, there's been a new development on this passage as well. And that is not seeing four kingdoms, but seeing five kingdoms. Babylon, the Medes and the Perds, Medes and the, you know what I'm saying, Persians, the Greeks, the, the legs of iron being Rome, and then the feet being a future Roman empire that will come together. And that view has been seen over the last 150 years, give or take. So it does not have the historical credence going back 2,000 years. And so those are the three dominant views that are held within the church. And so again, I take the Roman view. Babylon is the head. And we see in Daniel that the Medes and the Persians destroy Babylon. And then we see Alexander the Great swiftly coming and destroying the Medes and the Persians. And then finally, Rome overtaking it. And the reason they become brutal is because they intermarry. If you know anything about Roman history, you know that the, those that are in high places, they began giving their children off to other nations, intermarrying. And Rome eventually collapsed on itself. Their empire is so massive, so great, that they couldn't even feed the army anymore. And so as they're fighting the wars against the northern tribes, weak, they're tired, and they come to an end. But in this, and here's the main point, the stone. The stone that shatters the image. Across the board, everyone understands that this is Jesus. He's the stone. Debate surrounds of when does this stone shatter the image? Does it happen in a future event or does it happen in the time of Christ? And I take the, the traditional view that it happens in the time of Christ. And as Christ comes, dies, raises, the nations are shattered and that stone as history continues, becomes a glorious mountain. It's just like the parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom of God starts with just a simple seed planted in the ground, and a great tree emerges. This is the kingdom of Christ. The one we are a part of. No nation can stand against Christ. They will be shattered in the last days. He will come and shatter them. But now, no kingdom can stand against the kingdom of Christ here. If you are in Christ, you cannot be taken from his kingdom. It's impossible. He holds you tightly. And his kingdom expands upon the earth as the Great Commission gets done, as the gospel flourishes, Daniel finishes the interpretation, and Nebuchadnezzar's response is what? Down before Daniel. Paying honor, homage, bring an offering and bring incense and offer it to him. 
What's interesting is Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar both have a response to the revealing of the dream. Daniel says, God be the glory. Nebuchadnezzar is focused on Daniel. In verse 47, he says, truly your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar's heart has not changed. He's just added Yahweh as one more God to his polyistic setting. Daniel is given high honors. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also given high honors. And Daniel remains in the king's court. And just imagine as an exile hearing this. God, where are you? We're under the Babylonian's thumb. Where are you? And the vision says, don't worry, there's a, there's a stone coming. Christ is coming, and he will shatter everything. The inaugurated kingdom now, and one day to be consummated. And brothers and sisters, when that consummation happens, it will be glorious. No more sin, no more death, no more wrestling with the things that we wrestle with. No more being divided on earthly and heavenly things. Just total praise and honor to the God we dwell with. Because Christ the King has shattered everything. And so we look to Christ. He himself said, I am the cornerstone whom the builders rejected. Christ is our cornerstone. And so we will we live that way today. Will we see the cornerstone for all of his glory, for all of his worth, rested up on the cross for us? He shatters the nations, and that is our king, the one whom we devote our life to because of the Spirit's work. Let us pray. Lord, the great stone of Christ is so awesome. His power and his might is unmatched. No human can stand before him, blaspheme, and not be struck down. And so, Lord, we are thankful that we stand on the cornerstone, the cornerstone of Christ, the one who gives salvation, the rock in which the water flows. Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you for bringing us into and making us a kingdom of priests and a holy of nation, according to 1 Peter 2. Lord, we love you, and we long to be with you forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.